I said in the first service, I've been blessed with a wife that's engaging and can show excitement. I have not been given that gift from the Lord. And uh, I said, uh, I think this is something like, you know, pretty monotone. And then I started in January 21, monotone on the inside, and getting monotone on the outside. Then I had a crisis of identity because someone said after the first service, oh, you're not engaging. You never want to know. Am I engaging? Am I not engaging? Um, so thank you. Uh, to Pastor Matt and Julie, just want to thank them because they hosted us last night and they came and blessed us with that night for breakfast together. Uh, Ed Shop, it's been going on in the last number of years. We talked about it um, seven years ago, it was 2017. We were here, I think, for the first time. And like, Leo, you need to get a new pastor, Pastor Matt. And so we met him one day and said, like, we should know each other. He looks so familiar. We couldn't figure out how our lives are like, but we we remember each other last night when we saw each other. So yeah, just thank you for hosting us. Thank you for our, for the church. We don't get here very often, not as often as we normally do. And our communion read our, our newsletters uh, with some of you guys, and so that's kind of exciting for us. It also probably means you know us better than you know you. Which is a shame. Because um, I'm sure it would be some great conversations and relationships. So I think about it. I'm just really different. And it's been on the Lord. I hope that I can get my emotion and my mind out of the way. I'm also even when I said tongues, so I'm so confused. And just this understanding we will have eternity together to talk about our experiences. In that case, the divine communication for us is not time. We've been divided to communicate for a lot of eternity to talk about. I appreciate you what's happening in your life and, and all of the plain stuff. And even when Jeremy was talking about just shipping materials, you can talk to Pastor Matt just on like the mundane tasks that pastors have to do. Um, that's part of their job. And, and being a missionary is not all um, rosy and there. Insinuated to that. How do we talk about the negative, the hard things that we've experienced and yet also communicate? It's kind of fun to follow the Lord. I hope for those of you who are not in full time ministry, you'll also feel the same way. Not that it's easy, but it's interesting to see what He challenges us with and continues to use to grow us towards maturity. Um, you can still listen. You're also coming in with the John Deere hat. Um, I'm also a John Deere guy, so we have pretty good connections. But for Kevin, he was 30 years as an HVAC technician. And that's the had to go into full time ministry with this team because it's real hard for one on one discipleship. Dan was doing foundational disciple making more in the setting, and so we invited Kevin in to kind of fill that more one on one role. And then, you know, over time, when we joined, there was quite a bit of interpersonal conflict between the two of them. And so we've been walking Ted with Kevin, um, talking about the realities that life in ministry is not always easy. And we kind of went into it. Like, I remember when I left the farm, it was getting rid of some challenges, but it's also going to be some challenges in ministry. I actually should want the challenge because it's true that that God's going to continue to, like, stretch and to grow to grow up. So for Ted, if you was saying, you know, full-time ministry, this is going to be awesome. We get to do discipleship all the time. How would that not be wonderful? And then when he goes into this um, difficulty, it becomes what is going on. So I can only tell that story because what we're going to talk about is foundational truth or foundational Bible teaching. Sounds amazing. You know, like, wow, what a great thing. Something foundational, but to me, what it really means is like taking a truth that we see in Scripture. For example, that God is Creator. As Creator, He is also Owner, which means He can put me on the shelf for a time if He chooses, and I need to be okay with that. He can also take me off, put me in a different role. I just learned this because those of you who followed us, when we're in a meeting on the way to come here, now we're flying here in Canada. Who knows where the Lord will bring us next? Be okay with him shifting and moving us around. And then I have the same questions that some of you have. You lose a job, you have health problems. Is it okay for God to do this to my life? He really is his creator owner. 
And so that's even more often experienced with Ken, who's a little bit older than us, 10 to 12 years older than me. How do I, like, come alongside him as a brother, as an equal? And I was like, I think uh, Matt was saying, you know, Jason and Aaron are here. Like, well, that's me. It's Gary Farmer from the Center of Ontario, you know, for the West Peace Award, becoming a missionary. And I'm nobody, really, to hang around this opportunity to share. And so God's been doing in our, in our life and in our ministry. It's just serving. It's a fancy word for just serving God. So today, Erin mentioned we're going to talk about um, one of the lessons that she had at Stanford. That's 101, we call it, just gospel foundations. It's split into four parts. So, um, creation, catastrophe, coming in Christ, just the walk from the future, from creation to resurrection. Um, so that's what we're going to do this morning. We're going to go through, through all four sections and hear the lessons of Erin. And I know there's there's another, there isn't another service. So the first truth we're going to look at from the flood, so the story of Noah and the flood, catastrophe section, is God's offer of mercy as an end. So he warns the living. Think about um, Noah. Have you ever been alone and the only person? And I'm the only one standing up on the stage right now. In a sense, there's a bit of pressure. You can probably see he's sweating like, I don't want you to be engaged with truth, but I'm up here alone. My neighbor John, what's he say? Um, Saskatchewan is right beside me. He's very in yeah. rugby area, so I'm going. He looks like he has a lot of friends. Last year on the Jew party, he confesses how heavy he is. And he's in the middle of going with me to help me. But how many of you have made it feel alone now and been alone? Well, no one was alone. Under years, really, right? Of being the only righteous person on earth. So that's what we're going to talk about. This guy that's alone. And can you find favor in the Lord's eyes? So to get back to this case point, God's offer of mercy as an end, so he warns the living. The ark. What is the ark? It's really a billboard of impending judgment, impending doom. How many of you have seen some of these movies that talk about, you know, there's a meteor coming or there's, you know, nuclear disaster? I always think of the movie Incredible Family. Some of you may remember that one. Um, you know, there's meteors coming. I think at the beginning they're like, oh, there's warning or something. The scientists discovered it. Um, a lot of time, then it can sound good, you know, we can send these rocks and we'll send a space shuttle. All these things that are going to go around the Earth. In other doomsday stories, there's no warning. They keep it quiet. Don't let the world know. But God in His mercy was letting the world know of what was to come. And not 12 days or 72 hours, a hundred years of letting the world know that judgment was coming. So it's not just a vessel, we'll come back to that, and there's definitely here of it being an ark of safety. But at this point, it's like a billboard warning the people of what's to come. So they have not, but his offer is mercy, he has an ark, so he's warning the living. The second one he's warning the living is through Noah. Right, we see here in 2 Peter 2 5, Noah is a preacher of righteousness, so God places him also on earth to be telling and warning the people, telling them what they are the billboard of what's to come. Let's, um, let's go to Genesis 6, verse 7 and 8. If you have your Bibles, Genesis 6, 7, 8. Sure, you get it right here. And the Lord God will wipe the human race that are created from the face of the earth. Yes, and I will destroy every living thing, all the people, the large animals, the small animals, the scurry on the ground, even the birds in the sky. I'm sorry, I never made them. But Noah found favor with the Lord. And then if you jump ahead to 22, Noah did everything exactly as God had commanded him. So you've got him warning the world of what's to come. You've got the ark. We'll go to that next slide. What is the ark a testimony to? Well, it's a testimony of the seriousness of the reckoning to come. It's a testimony of God's anger towards wickedness. It's also an indication of his justice and holiness. He has to deal with sin. And it's also the truth of God's mercy, giving people time to repent. 
but it's also an indication that that mercy will come to an end. I know if you have a pretty good year, you throw some rocks and some sticks in there, try and get it to hang on the floor for long enough, eventually it will burst. Similarly, in the book of Acts, slide. God's offer of mercy comes to an end, and for those of us that have this point in history, that ends upon our physical death. God's extending mercy long enough for us to choose to believe and to repent. For some, their time is longer than others and shorter, but we don't get more time based on how good works are making, you know, like balancing out between good and bad. Eventually, it will come to an end. We refuse to damn the damn burst in God's wrath against sin. Um, will come upon us upon our physical death. So, what happens when God's offer of mercy comes to an end? Well, He punishes the proud in His life. So, the mercy that His offer comes to an end and then punishes the proud. Let's read Genesis 7, 13 to 16. That very day, Noah had gone into the boat with his wife and his sons. Shem, Ham, and Japheth, and their wives. With him in the boat were pairs of every kind of animal, domestic and wild, uh, large and small, along with birds of every kind. Two by two they came into the boat, representing every living thing that breathes. A male and female of each kind entered, just as God had commanded Noah. Then he God closed the door behind them. Noah and his family get on the boat. So those who are not on the boat, what should they have been thinking? Well, God made all these animals for their years. They should righteousness. They should probably be thinking that they made a mistake. But then God closes the door, and that does that. And that continues to punish them with his wrath against sin. Well, let's go to the next slide. So when his mercy comes to an end, he's punishing the proud. No one leaves behind family, friends, if he had any, um, and his neighbors. And what, like for them, are they like, let me in? But God closed the door, so I can know anymore. God's timing is His timing. Could they have, like, maybe tried to build their own boat? Maybe offer sacrifices to appease God? Maybe they also thought, like, I'm going to drown. Maybe I won't, I won't drown. But no one decided, like, even if they had tried any of those things, what would happen? Next, the next slide. That wouldn't have mattered, right? punishment had come. Everything was destroyed, nothing in there survived. The face of the earth was wiped out. And this is where we look at, like, when we see our story and the heart that applies the truth. Well, the lake of fire is also a similar lake of eternal punishment. Instead of being immersed in water, you're immersed in, in fire. And what does the Bible say about the lake of fire? You can go to that next slide. Tells it's created as a punishment for Satan and his followers for their sin and rebellion against God. The truth is, it can't be avoided by any means other than through Christ, just as the ark was the only way to avoid the judgment of the flood. It offers no escape. Like the flood, I mean, there's no escape from that. So, go to the next slide. So, this, just to like, tie a little bit of the Truth and what I'm talking about into the resource, right source, just so you can get a sense of, of what is in there. This is like at the end of the conclusion. Just to uh, present these questions How many people try to ignore the evidence of coming judgment? So, you know, we talked a little bit about the old boat, some of this stuff from Noah's time, and it would have been possible. What about now? It's like, I'm young, there's lots of time to decide. Maybe it's I'm safe because my parents are in ministry or they're religious and they go to church or, you know, I tie and I attend church. Maybe it's, you know, good works, bad works, as if it's a balance, you know, enough of them will run away. Um, maybe it's total denial. Right? This, uh, there's no God. There's no judgment to come. You stick your head in the sand. Noah responded by God by simply believing. God said that a flood was coming to the boat. And Noah says, okay, similarly, Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Like the, the door of the ark is the only way into the ark. Likewise, is Christ the only way into um, 
begin to try to end the salvation. So that, that's kind of like from a gospel perspective, from the running away, or why we see it, which is from the water and the flood. Not only have came and I switch gears, what is the way we from the flood as believers? So I want our identity and security in Christ. We're going to look at our God now from the same story. So, in this lesson, there's kind of two, there's two truth points. I'm forever shielded from God's wrath because I saw Christ in Christ. And then because I am in Christ, the ark of eternal safety. So, we're going to look at the second truth point. Um, let's go back to Genesis 7. And we're going to look at verses 11 to 12 and then 17 um, to 23. So we're going to make this contrasting point. So, 7, 11 to 12. When Noah was 600 years old in the 17th day of the second month, all the underground waters were melted from the earth, and the rain fell in many torrents from the sky. The rain continued to fall for 40 days and 40 nights. And then it's the end of 17. For 40 days, the flood waters grew deeper, covering the ground, lifting the boat high. As the water froze high and higher above the ground, the boat floated safely on the surface. Only the water covered even the highest mountains in the earth, rising more than 20 to feet above the highest peaks. All the living things on earth died birds, domestic animals, wild animals, small animals, that scurried along the ground, and then all the people. Everything that breathed and lived on dry land died. God wiped out every living thing on the earth. People, livestock, small animals that scurry along the ground, and the birds of the, of the sky, all were destroyed. The only people who survived were Noah and those with him in the boat. So, in the middle of all this destruction, everything died. I am making that point again and again. Then we talk to about Noah and his family. They had followed God's command to set fire on her to build an ark, right, and carried that through to completion. Um, as a bit of a side note, researchers believe that the ark wasn't actually at capacity. It was probably only about 35 percent full. There was actually room for the people on the ark to have chosen to live, and yet they didn't. So it's just a side note. I just think it's interesting that God was working actually providing a place um, for people. So for Noah and his family, we go to the next slide. They are safe in the ark until the fury of God's wrath and perhaps right the right there a year. Um, and then after the fury part, which is they call the torrential rain, 40 days and 40 nights. But it also seems because they were the only ark of safety that God had provided. There wasn't another option, right? There wasn't another, you know, maybe one of these luxury cruise ships, right? Like they're about the same size, but there's no one around. Um, they're also safe. Because as God had shut them in, right? They went in, he closed the door. Next slide. For Christian, the ark serves as a symbol of Jesus Christ, the true ark. As the ark protected no one his family from the flood, Jesus also protects us from the fury of God's wrath. <clears throat> the word that we use for this is propitiation, which means... Um, satisfying the wrath of God against sin. Christ is our propitiation. It's also the propitiation of Jesus on that before the right. And this, the traffic really shows that in children. Yeah, but between God's wrath against sin, here's Christ that fully fulfilled and satisfied the payment for our sin. And then there's lastly, like, we have Christ in between us. How can we be sure that he's done this on our behalf? Well, we can be sure, for one, the temple, or the curtain in the temple between the Holy of Holies and the other sanctuary were open from top to bottom. Right? Christ made that possible and God ripped it. Secondly, we see that God raised Jesus from the dead, meaning that the sacrifice was acceptable to him. Thirdly, we see that Jesus is now in heaven, seated at the 
right hand of God the Father. So all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to him, so the work is complete. Romans 5, 9 to 10, since we have been justified by his blood, how much more shall we be saved from God's wrath through him? While we were God's enemies, we were reconciled to him through the death of his son. Jesus, in a sense, I think the, the definition for reconciled is like to make amends come to a true settled disagreement. And Jesus accomplished that on that behalf. Like no other is safe in the heart, the believer is also safe in Christ. The next slide. It's clear there's two camps. Believe and be accepted or reject Jesus, the ark of safety, and God's wrath will then fall upon us at our physical death. Ephesians 2, 3, 5 says that by nature we deserve God's wrath. Because we're born in sin, and by nature we're sinners. We're made right with God because of His mercy and made alive and safe in Christ, our ark of eternal safety. So just to like review, remember from the first one, God's mercy is going to have come to an end, so He mourns over the and punishes the proud. For those of us who are believers, the ark meaning Christ, represents Christ, is our safety. But there's only so much time for us and for those around us. What will we do with that information? So that's kind of like looking at the story from a foundational truth and then applying that to our life. For us, like right now, when we're kind of, what's happening in 13, where is the Lord going to take us both through this and then after, like to what? We come back to foundational truths, like what I said at the beginning, creating our own or anything out, putting us on the shelf again. I think the last time we were here, I might have talked a little bit about, you know, we're in the hallway. It seemed like there was all of these options. Which door was the one that was going to be open? Maybe some of them remember that. Somebody would open the door and it would start to open the door. There's a train on it. You're too loud and it only opens so far. But it's not an every right to do that. And we also, even as missionaries, whatever that is, um, have to keep reminding ourselves of truth. Because it's very easy for our flesh to take us in a different direction. To, you know, I think I was talking to someone after the first service that the world's bombarding us with individualism and we deserve the answer and sure the job is totally fulfilling to you. But really, what is truth talk about that? When Christ saved us and we want to serve him. Of his goodness toward us. Let's just close in prayer. Thanks for the time. Um, listening to me, hopefully, I resonated with some of you. But you'll think about those things in your own life. I think um, we pray for people that are going through cancer and illness. Like, how do you apply foundational truth to that? Is not sickness and illness. Like, we know it's time to fall. Right? Like, that's a reality of sin and the flesh that we live in. It's also part of God warning the living about what's to come, right? The mortality of our lives is this point where our life is going to end. Without sickness, cancer, our problems, my dad had a heart attack when we were in North Asia. Was I going to get to see him again? Like, all of those are kind of a warning that the end is coming. And we can always see it that way. We can feel really sorry for that you're kind of experiencing the effects of the fall. And I am truly sorry for that, but I also want to see it as a God's warning um, for us. And let, let's kind of look at it that way. So to those that are neighbors around us who are experiencing cancer, they're in the audience of God's safety. Right? They're more like the flood side. But they, at, at that point, they still have time. So let, let, let's think about it that way, about truth and then act on it. So those, some free extra minutes are going to pray. I would thank you just, I really thank you for your word, and we really are so blessed to have it in our own heart language in English and so many translations. What a privilege we have to pick it up. Um, really, most of us have grown up in or at least now experiencing in order to pick up like our Bible, study it for ourselves. And the truth that we see in there, yes, we want it to. Uh, bring uh, ourselves and those around us to salvation. You know, we move into the ark of Christ's safety. 
but there's also um, a lot of hurting in the world around us, and there's waste. Um, you know, it's nice out here in Fenton Falls and in Caucasian to be a testimony of what, uh, of your goodness, also a testimony, kind of like an art, like a billboard of um, a message of salvation, as, as you give them that role. So I just pray for as long as they reach into the community and also just to encourage one another within this body um, towards maturity and towards um, building relationships with neighbors and with friends and on sport teams and in workplaces an opportunity to share about um, the goodness of our God and His mercy that we have time. We deserve to have the need of time that we might hear those are the truths. God, with those around us, in Jesus' name, amen.